Very kind of you with this cold weather. Yeah, <laughs> I love the fact that they called us energetic. Like these two guys haven't slept at all because of the time difference, and I'm a, I'm completely hangover since the meeting started really early this morning. So very energetic. But hey, super nice to be here today. Yeah. Like uh, we've been talking about this with Encore for several years. It would be cool to get you guys to slush, and here we are today on the stage. So that's right. pretty cool. Thank you for having us. Yeah. So. David, originally from Amsterdam, and Ankur from um, Seattle. Also cold. <laughs> also cold. But uh, hey, first of all, I'd like to get to understand a bit better about you guys and how you guys originally met each other. Like Ankur, when you were 21, you were uh, named by Inc. Magazine as the most networked 21-year-old person on Earth. Like, how the hell did you get to that point? Like, there was higher huh. society was somehow involved, but yeah. how did you get started? Uh, you know, it's funny, looking at slush, you would forget that just eight years ago, the idea of being an entrepreneur wasn't cool. Saying you were an entrepreneur typically meant you weren't smart enough to get a normal job. And so in 2008, when the world hit the major financial crisis, we started to see a shift where all this top talent coming out of universities around the world that traditionally would have gone into banking and consulting were finally open, the opportunity cost allowed them to go and take on entrepreneurship as a path, uh, which led to the start of Cairo Society with this idea of, could we focus the next generation of founders, a lot of the people here in this audience, on solving some of the world's biggest problems? Um, and over the last eight years, that's grown and uh, become now one of the world's largest uh, venture funds and incubators for young entrepreneurs. Cool. And how did a guy from Amsterdam end up like meeting this guy with a vision for yeah, like future entrepreneurship? Um, <laughs> it's, it was very serendipitous, to be honest. Um, we have no direct connections. Um, our family uh, was put in touch by a mutual friend, and they put they when Ankur then traveled abroad to do an exchange program in Rotterdam. Um, he connected with my father, and they had a meeting where Ankur was talking about the Cairo Society. And, um, and an awkward moment. Where, you know when you meet someone and they're like, oh, you must meet my son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is, this is what happened. He met him and he was so excited. So when he finally got, my dad got home, he says, oh, this amazing a young entrepreneur, you should meet him. And I'm like, okay, how often does this actually happen, to, to Ankur's point? Like where your dad comes home or your, someone in your family comes home and says, you have to meet this person. It never works and, out. It never works it's out. Like, like, it's like your, being set up on a blind date. Right, yeah. your first instinct is, oh. So, but I go and we sit there and he's, he felt the same way, you could tell. So the first like moments were, uh, were a lot of friction in the conversation. But we ended up hitting it off and uh, we had lunch the next day. Uh, it was a, a, the first date worked out well. Like, in, so, like any good Tinder uh, experience, it was a match. Yeah, we matched, we matched. And yeah, so ever since, we've, we've stuck together, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, when, when talking about companies, people often talk about magical pairs who start companies together. And in a sense, your matchmaker was your father's. In, uh, yes, <laughs> a mutual friend of our father's, which was... Uh, yeah. And what year was this? This was... Ooh, 2009, nine, I think. 2009. And you guys have been pretty much doing things together since then, seven years. Yeah. So what was it about in the very beginning that ended up like you two clicking like that? I'll say... You know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> People, when they're starting companies, often feel like they need to find the, quote, right co-founder with the right templated skills. And I think they forget that startups are changing constantly. Your, your business model is changing. Your product is changing. You're going to go through ups and downs throughout the entire journey. So the only constant that you can really control is the person you start the company with. And so with David and I, as we quickly became friends, the idea of actually building companies together as friends first and business partners second was something that I think we both have held strong in our values uh, as entrepreneurs. And yeah, people say that, you know, it's, uh, it's a good thing to start a company with a friend, but it can be a terrible choice at the, at the same time. Like, what was the low point of you two <laughs> like working together. What has been the absolute lowest point, the moment when you almost like fell apart, you weren't the magical the, the, pair anymore? I would say the funny thing about the way we work, and that's why we're still together, is when <laughs> one is low... This is like relationship yeah, counseling. Yeah, this is like relationship <laughs> counseling, exactly. Um, when one of us is low, we do very well and the other one being high. So when one feels like... I, I remember at a certain point when uh, we were doing extremely... Like the first moment when 
we had a certain feature launch in our product and it actually took off. There was lots of tracking, traction and our service broke down. He was in the office, crumbled up on his couch like this. And I came in and I'm like, dude, what's going on? I can't do it anymore. Like he was literally like a broken down animal. Thanks. But, yeah. And look at him, he's still here. So, no, and it, it just shows you that like at that time, I didn't feel that, that same low as he did. And what we do well is we balance each other out. Yeah, so, you know, and I'll say, you know, our, it's funny, but again, if you think about starting companies with people you trust, people that are there, as things iterate, you stick together. And so it's funny, but our biggest fight, actually, so we grew yeah. Kairos for four years before we hired a new team, which are actually here. I think it's like, I think it's like 50 people from Kairos here. So it's exciting. It's pretty cool. But before we, before we left and handed off Kairos, we sat down to figure out what is the next company we want to launch. And I was determined after seeing so many incredible founders in Kairos tackling these hard technology problems in energy and education and healthcare. I said, David, we need to go become industrialists. We need to go take on the big, hard, you know, physical challenges. And David looked at me with the angriest face and was like, and was, told me I was an idiot. And we fought and we fought and he said, you just wait and watch, we're gonna end up doing a tech company. And apparently, without my knowing, they went and created a thing called Operation Dropbox. <laughs> this, the, the name came because he said, like, I don't want to be the next Dropbox, or I don't want to be like the next internet startup. I want to build this big industrial company. Hence, like, for instance, uh, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give you an example. What's a big industrial company? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Like both. So we, we were sitting there, and so we had, you know, this is the way where I said, dude, we're going to do this industrial thing. We built this entire business plan. That's funny. Every startup has their media story, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, everybody tells you how they had this burning desire to solve X problem and they couldn't sleep and they went after. The true stories are always a little bit messier. <laughs> and for us, when we you know going into human, it wasn't that we had this vision of solving the contact management problem in a way that no one else does. We were actually in the process of trying to figure out how to bring industrial technologies from Asia to Europe and Europe to the United States. And, and we were going to go bring the cooling systems for nuclear power plants into the United States. <laughs> and so we built this whole model and we were trying to figure out how to get access to the right people. And as we were doing that, we were building this contact system to help us manage all the crazy people that we were connecting with in this industry. And then we brought together a group of investors and we had this formal deck to pitch them of how we were going to import this technology, what our financials were. And then at the end, we said, and by the way, we've got this really cool system we're using to help us figure out how to build this. The investors in the room looked at us and said, cooling systems idea is stupid, but we'll fund that contacts project. Yeah. <laughs> and David's smile was... Yeah. <laughs> it was the only win I had since working together. <laughs> Yeah, so how do you feel about that? Like, as an entrepreneur, one thing you have to face is that you usually have a hypothesis. Like, you have an idea how the world works, and you will do something how, to change that, you know, how it will work. Uh, so, but oftentimes we find out when we start doing something that it actually didn't go as we planned, and we might learn something new on the way. So, right. how was it for you guys? Like, you'd prepared, you'd been working to get something done, you had a vision, this is how it's going to be, and suddenly you're in a situation that you have to completely change everything you thought before. Well, the good, thing, the good thing is I think we've surrounded ourselves always with the right people that were able to steer us in the right direction as we were trying things. Uh, in this case, again, like our mentors and the people around us said, like, you guys should focus on this context thing versus trying to solve this big multinational industrial problem that you're looking at and focus on that. And during this entire process, uh, when, we, we, when we started building the context app, Human, we use that same f um, feedback uh, system to build that out. And I'd, I'd say, look, every founder here has gone through iterations. Right? And it's funny because the number one sign of a founder lying to you is if you ask them how things are going and they respond, great, everything is great. Because on the same 24-hour period, you're on the brink of tremendous success and the brink of death. It's this <laughs> psychological mind fuck. And so... So, Mickey, how's Walt doing? <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, we, so we, 
you know, as we think about the evolution of things like, you know, the cooling systems, the human, et cetera, what we started to learn is, number one, as a founder, there is no such thing as failure. Right? Everything is just a pivot. And as you're thinking about how do you achieve this, this broader vision, the one lesson I can say that we learned is that all the things that people tell you to worry about as a founder, the capital, the marketing, the user access, all, what really matters to start is just product market fit. Are you really solving a problem that people beyond just you care about? And is your product that you're building simple enough and easy enough to use that people, without any briefing or introduction from us as founders, can understand, grasp, and love? And if you can solve that, the rest is just execution challenges. And that basically, like, was how it went. You met at Kairos, you worked together, you figured that we want to build something together. You were thinking about a couple of ideas, you know, tried some one thing, you got feedback, and that eventually led into human. So, uh, like, how did the company then start? Like, you eventually sold the company, uh, was it last spring, to Tinder? Yeah, this, April. this actually is so, past April. April. So yeah. how long did you work on the company? Three years. Three years. How many pivots did you do? Like, how many times did you iterate what you were doing, like, in a bigger iteration? How, what did you say? Daily. So, <laughs> there's, so again, there's, it, there's, there was little iterations, little pivots constantly. I mean, I think even at Tinder, every day we're thinking about how do you iterate on this product to continue removing friction. And but, we'll get back to that later. Uh -oh. <laughs> but, but what we did learn early on at, at Human is that when you're, we, we found product market fit early looking at the contact system. We saw very quickly that People did care about their relationships. They wanted more reasons to reconnect. They wanted the insight to remember people the way they naturally think. Because if you ask people how often they forget a name, it happens to all of us. But the fact that you couldn't just open your phone book and say, who was that guy I met last night at Slush, is crazy. And so once we realized that, it was just a matter of iterations, iterations, until we finally got that right. Yeah. And that eventually led you guys to selling the company to Tinder. And this is something like probably a lot of people here are wondering about. Like, what is it like to get acquired? Like, what, what was the decision process on your end that ended up with that? What was the first day that you're now not an entrepreneur but an employee at Tinder? What was it like? It was, it, it was unexpected, to be honest. Like, first, when you start a company, I think every founder goes into that process and wanting to build a business for the long run. It's, it, no, no one goes into this business wanting to sell a company. Um, and throughout the process, and that's why the roller coaster, the, the topic of this, of this talk is the roller coaster, you see what works and you see what doesn't. And, and you, as we went throughout this process, we saw we had big wins and also big mistakes or fails, if you will. And at a certain point, we thought it, was, would, have been, it would be better for us to be part of a company that's already in the hands of millions of people, then try to accomplish that ourselves. It's, it's funny, and I give a lot of credit to uh, Sean, who started Tinder, but there are, acquisitions can go any which way, right? And as a founder, the decision, I know you dealt with this question recently, which is, do you sell or do you continue fighting? Right? And there's this challenge because emotionally, a startup is your, it's your baby. Right? And the idea of letting it go is a crazy, scary concept. And so as much as that's motivated by the, the potential capital return, selling a company often is also a matter of, do you align in your beliefs? Right? And so for us, like Tinder wasn't the obvious acquisition choice oh. when we started that process and people were approaching us. We actually originally thought, contact management would be something more like a LinkedIn, a Google, a Microsoft. We spent a lot of time talking with those guys, but the value alignment wasn't there. Right? And that's something that I think people don't realize how difficult and emotional that decision is, right? Because it's not just us. It's the team that joined you as a startup when you were nothing, when they came in and took pay cuts and they were working 20 hours a day, if all of a sudden you just sell to a business that doesn't share that vision and that, those values, you've, you've turned your back on the people that trusted you most. And was there a moment, because you were the co-founders, was there a moment that you went into a room and looked, to, looked at each other in the eyes and you were like, you know, do we really want to do this, do this or not? Like, how did it feel? To do what? Say again. 
Where did you go into a room and look each other into the eyes and <laughs> be like, this you isn't know, actually right. <laughs> <laughs> like, do we actually want to do this? Like, what was the moment that you agreed that you know this is something we should do? I think it's it was just a given. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. It was. It, what was given is what we looked and like we talked about like what, where are we now, and what do we want to accomplish, and what, how, what can we accomplish, and this was the solution. Look, if you're having, if you're not having fun in your startup life, you're not doing it right, and that doesn't mean that it's all happy-go-lucky and positive, right? I mean, again, there's the highest of highs and lowest of lows, but in a crazy way, entrepreneurs have to be a little bit sick in the mind to enjoy it. But once you do. It's that's the indicator of whether you know you should move forward or not. Or are you enjoying? Does this feel like the reason you wake up every day? Whether you're on the bottom fighting your way up, or you're at the top continuing to grow, and like having your best friend at your side as you're building a company, is this incredible way to make the process, the ups, the downs, fun? And a lot of entrepreneurs, like one thing I've noticed, and I, I remember when I was still running Slush, I used to respect enormously people who'd raised like a two million round or a ten million round or made an exit. I still do, but I remember looking at that kind of like a milestone. That's that's a milestone that you get to, and you look up to these people that those guys have gotten there. And then in reality, when you get to those milestones, the reality is that oh fuck, we have more to do, and there's another milestone that's farther away. And like, how how did it feel? Like people talk about getting acquired as one milestone. So, what was the feeling after it? Was it a feeling of relief? Was it a feeling of disappointment? Like, what was the emotional uh, status after you guys have made the decision? I would say this is what both. We're gonna do? The, the, you have both emotions. You're happy because you're you made a decision and you wanted to work for that company, and you want now to see what this technology can mean for that company, for Tinder in this case. And at the second time, like. It's different not running your own company. It's a different process. It's like when you when you work for your own company, like there's so many. Going back to the fun moments, it's like there's so many things that you learn as you're building a company that are are awkward, bring you out of your comfort zone. Which is one of uh, just just reminds me of a funny story. Actually, is things that bring you out of your comfort zone. He's always said to me. When we're working together, let's build off each other's strengths and learn from each other. And one of the things I used to never do was actually talk to press. I hated it. I just didn't feel comfortable at all. And he always said, like David, you have to do this. It's good for you. It's good for the brand, but it's also good for the company. So at a certain point, he uh, he forced me into it. So he says, like, okay, we'll start small. There's this Pennsylvania Times newspaper. This is just for the students who go to Penn St- uh, Penn University, UPenn, and But in my mind, a journalist was going to interview me. Anyway, this this 19-year-old girl gives me a call, and I was pre- I had prepared everything in my head. I knew exactly what I wanted to say. So I'm sitting there in my room in her in her office, locked myself in so no one would disturb me. And she's asking me questions, and I'm answering them, and I'm uh, things are actually going pretty well, I think. So at a certain point, like as the conversation or the interview ends, I hate silences. So there's there's a silence, and I could hear her type, and I'm like, what is she typing? I like, <laughs> I should fill the silence. So I said, I, and I had never been to Pennsylvania, so I go, so I should visit you sometime. <laughs> Not thinking, oh my God, this is a 19-year-old girl. So she goes, why why do you want to visit me? I'm like, huh? What do you mean? I'm like, oh God, no, 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 I didn't mean it that way. And I said, bring it back to the bring it back to the interview. Bring it back to the interview. So I go, should I send you a picture? And she goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm so sorry. So I run to Encore. I said, I gave him the phone. Article came out, entire interview about Encore and her, and then it said, David Weiler said, this company is great. <laughs> But, so that was my. The best part was after that, he actually went and sent her his photo. <laughs> oh my God. Thanks for making it worse. I already am sharing something. <laughs> so that's how it goes. And now yeah. you guys are working together still. Like uh, it used to be Kairos, uh, then it became Human, and now you guys are at Tinder. Yeah. And how does it work out? Like you're running uh, partnerships with Tinder these days. Like yeah. first of all, what is a partnership at Tinder? So basically, anyone who matches is because of me. No, no, I'm kidding. No. Um, <laughs> what what I what I do is I I look to help a Tinder. Um, Find ways to distribute the app uh, internationally, and at the same time, how do you enable people to meet up in the real world? And you do that by by 
um, uh, enriching profiles, so they have reasons to communicate with each other. You work with uh, interesting partners like Spotify that allow you to then show, show each other what your favorite music, music is or what we call your anthem. Um, there's a bunch of stuff we're working, uh, we're working with T-Mobile now that is actually zero rating uh, Tinder data traffic now in a couple countries, which is cool. So stuff like that. Yeah, and if you work for Uber, you get a discount from Uber, all Uber drives. So what do you get if you work for Tinder? We get, uh, there's this thing called Tinder Select that we're, uh, that's pretty cool that we're on now. <laughs> okay, cool. What about product? Like, you used to run product for human. And, uh, like, and I, mean, I can imagine, like, looking at Vault, like, it's a dear thing yeah. to your heart. And suddenly you're working on, on a bigger product, and much of it has been built by people before you. Like, what is it like to actually take over, over a product like that? A product that many people, I would imagine, here as well use. Yeah, so... Uh, first, let's say, as much as Tinder is a large company, we still are a team of startup founders. And so it's funny, but the, there's three people together that we run the product at company. It's Sean. Yeah. How the many founders. people is the team in general? The, the, the company the is team. about 200 people. 200 people. Uh, but Sean, who's the founder and CEO, Brian Norgard, who's here and is my co-head of product, and myself. And, and what's interesting, I think this says a lot about Tinder, is all three of us have been founders and CEOs at our own point. And so we really strongly believe that the only way for us to survive is to continue innovating as if we were a startup at our last leg. Right. And so when we think about where we are now, we don't look at ourselves as the giant in the industry. Right. We instead think we've gotten to the phase where Snapchat was three years ago. Right? They were a disappearing messaging app that was taking off. But it was really the next set of product evolutions that turned it from that into a $25 billion media company. And we sit here every day asking ourselves, we've just started scratching the surface of what does it mean to remove friction from people getting together? What does it mean to create an interface so simple that over 25 million people a day connect in a new match on Tinder? Think about that. And we ask ourselves, what do you do with that? How do you then create new behaviors, new ecosystem effects where if people are now matching through Tinder, how do we get people together through Tinder? And so it is like a startup. And so even though it's a big company, like every single day, we get to walk in and treat this as if it's like a brand new startup taking on a new entire space. And that takes us back to the beginning. Like, uh, as everyone knows, building a company is an emotional roller coaster. Like, you wake up in the morning and you're feeling excited. You see all the opportunities and you think that if everything goes well, we're going to conquer the world. And then you go to sleep at night. You can't get to sleep because you're afraid of like failing. You're afraid that you brought the team together to do the wrong thing and everyone's just wasting time. Right. What would you tell yourself, like, now having seen the journey from human start? all the way to Tinder. Like, what would you say you're, tell yourself in those kind of darkest moments? Because those are the most difficult moments where you're an entrepreneur. Find the a different co-founder. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously speaking, what so, advice would you give yourself when you, like, you're in that darkest moment? I mean, it, being, a, being a founder, you have to be delusionally optimistic. Right? <laughs> but at the same time, you can't help but worry. When you're, when you're the founding team, like you said, everyone is looking at you. Everyone's turning to you. Everyone expects you to have the answer. And the reality is, no matter how good you are, how bad, there's no way to know what the right answer is. There is no right answer. And so you're making this bet with this sense of certainty to get the entire team to follow through. And, and that's scary. Um, and I think this goes back to where we started, which is that starting a company alone, I can't even imagine doing that. Starting a company with someone who's purely a business partner, I still can't imagine. But having a friend to go through the ups and downs with is, I think, the most important part of going through that startup journey. So that would you be the one, one thing that you've taken away, is that start the company with someone that you, you, will, you will be together. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a pretty good ending note. Like, Ankur, it's been, it's been nice to get you guys here. Yeah, we thank actually, you for having us. Yeah, we actually met with Ankur. Uh, when he ch we happened to meet in St. Petersburg, I think in 2011. Uh, earlier than that even. Yeah, maybe. and uh, I remember that you said to me, we had like, met for four hours, and you said that if you're ever in San Francisco, send me a message like you can crash at my place. And then he sent you a message that, hey, I, I just... I hadn't heard from Mickey in over a year. <laughs> 
And then, then one day, I sent you, I, I just landed in San Francisco and I sent you a message that, hey, that offer's still up. Yeah, he crashed on my couch. <laughs> He's yeah. still there. So <laughs> yeah. always, always send that message like, thank you guys for being here thank today. You for having uh, I really look forward to what the magical pair the two of you will do next, whether it's at Tinder so or after Tinder. Thank you. Thanks, hey, thanks, thanks thank you. guys. It's around.